So our, our thanks to the panel for their excellent presentations. Um, we've got some microphones over to the side of the room. Um, and while people are thinking about the questions, right, let me ask one first of the panel. Um, so each and every one of you mentioned um, an incredible narrative. So um, Soji, the one that was my takeaway with Kenya and GE, um, Mona, obviously the work that PATH has done in Vietnam is a large example, multifaceted. Oren talked a lot about the history of UNICEF, but also the more recent gates going from kind of a silo to shared principles. And um, uh, Gowden's just mentioned a couple, one being the PIP, which is interesting, um, and the other one being the NTDs and the, and the donation. So hearing all these, my question to the group is, how do, so if we're interested in kind of raising confidence and actually over time changing the culture so that this idea of public-private engagement uh, and, and public-private collaboration will expand our reach collectively, how can we improve the narrative so that we, that we're able to kind of raise that confidence and that comfort level? So it sounds like we all, they all exist, but I'm curious, how do we kind of bring it together and raise it, Gaudens? I, I did mention before, on, our biggest challenge is to make people understand the, the rollout of FENSA and the rollout of an engagement strategy to have our under, staff understand, yes, you can take risks. Yes, you can engage. So while Dr. Tedros is very clear, I think uh, Peter and myself are very clear, that doesn't mean that each of the 7,500 staff members knows. Um, I remember some of our country directors during FENSA negotiations saying, oh, actually that is so risky. Even for civil society, it's so risky. We better don't engage. Um, so we have to encourage them. We're building a strategy. We have on the civil society front, working with the UN Foundation on the civil society task team, they will come on a recommendation on how, how we engage stronger. But basically to push to all corners of the organization how we can really engage much more. Um, Mona? This one? Yes. How about now? Yeah, I think again the importance of having that communication, speaking speaking the same language. I think there's inherent distrust or mistrust sometimes in many many settings that I've worked, and having a partner or a party that can be a bridge to try and explain even terminology. I remember working with the government of Vietnam on this concept of a, a total market approach. And there was, you know, sometimes it's literally the language that needs to be translated and then translated again because there was an assumption that meant totally free market, totally, totally commercial sector approach. And so it was reassuring the government that they are still the overseer and steward of the overall health system, but here is the role of private sector actors who actually do share the same goals, but have some additional objectives along the way. But having that kind of broker seems to be very, very helpful. I was talking to the gentleman sitting next to me this morning. Now that I'm in Silicon Valley and working with a lot of tech companies, I feel like I need a translator, you know, just to speak understand each other's language. I'm coming from the field in global health. They're wanting to be more involved in, in global health, but we're speaking a different language. So how do you have that way of connecting on what is the common shared value? Yeah, maybe just follow up on that. Um, I was thinking exactly the same thing. I mean, first of all, I think trust takes time. And there needs to be an expectation that any deep and meaningful collaboration, whether it's a full shared value partnership or something a little bit less than that, it's going to take months. It may take years. Um, when I look at, you know, what we've accomplished at UNICEF, uh, both across the, the business and the foundation spectrum, I mean, our most meaningful collaborations are, the, are with partners that we have had dialogue with for a very, very long time. Um, 
I think I couldn't agree more on the, the importance of brokers. And I would say that the way that we are set up in our organization is we recognize the importance of having both technical leads, but also partnership leads, because we bring different skill sets to the table. And, you know, the success of the Gates partnership, as one example, is really a meeting of the minds. You know, at the end of the day, we're not going to be able to deliver without the technical competence, but you need partnership people, people who can speak both languages um, to really kind of help help navigate, you know, some very difficult waters sometimes. And, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we often have, you know, very, very different languages and understandings of, of very, very subtle terms sometimes, which can really make or break um, the nature of the partnership. Thanks. Uh, first, I want to thank my uh, fellow panelists for a damn good education this afternoon. Right now, now to your to your question, um, raising confidence and changing the culture. Uh, I would like to outline at least five items, and I'll just go uh, very quickly. I think the first one is uh, clarity of purpose and making an extra effort to try and get that message out. Just what is this about? I think that's really, that's really important. It's not sufficient uh, that the proponents uh, get it or are clear among themselves. I think it's essential that just about every, every other party uh, understands what it's about as well. Now, whether they agree with it or not is a second other question. <coughs> Second one is engagement with multiple stakeholders. Uh, being very clear about uh, who has what levers uh, over which kinds of decisions, uh, who is likely to benefit from the proposition, and frankly, who is likely to lose from the proposition, because those who are like, likely to, uh, those who are losing from the proposition or who regard themselves as losers from the proposition are likely to be more strongly motivated than those who will gain from the proposition. And if you don't believe me, just uh, take one hour to study the history of the uh, Affordable Care Act in the United States. Okay? But I digress. <laughs> then uh, the, the next one I'm about to say is going to get me banished permanently from the National Academies, uh, I'm sure. Uh, so I'm taking my life in my hands now. And I'll say, Folks in health and medicine, and I will refer to them uh, as the, the public health fraternity and sorority, really need to learn and be comfortable with the language of business and the market. I think there is profound ignorance uh, in our ranks, and I'm saying this with all humility, but we're among friends, so let's call it spade a spade. Uh, I think there's profound ignorance among our ranks, and, uh, and there's profound, av profound aversion to learning about the business world, and the market. In fact, I also go so far as to say nobody should be allowed to enroll in the first year MD who has not taken uh, Business Economics 101 and who has not uh, had a, a good exposure to how markets work and how markets fail. Okay? So am I ejected now? No, no. Keep not yet. Going. Okay. You're only in number three. Then uh, I think rec recognize that, uh, recognize that for scale, it becomes politically more challenging. I don't think it's going to be very difficult to uh, get everybody to sign on to the idea of doing uh, some itty bitty uh, test in a corner of, uh, or, uh, of uh, Karnataka or one little corner of, of, uh, of Liberia. No, that's okay. But if you're going to do something on a large scale, then you really ruffle feathers. And that requires a different kind of skill set from the classic piloting uh, to do. Uh, then finally, and I think I said this before in, in a previous session, I think an attention to the, the, the counterfactual, the compare to what question. Okay? Uh, one of the things I've observed uh, is that th there is this tendency to say, if you can go from 30% to 60%, well, that's actually pretty good. Then you lock in your gains, and then you strive for 65%. Uh, but sometimes in our enterprise, um, if you're going from 30 and you, you reach 45, you actually might get uh, a lot of pushback that, gee, why haven't you achieved perfection yet? 
Uh, I understand that in, in baseball, and I'm not, Lord knows I'm not good in baseball, if you hit one in three, you are going to the Hall of Fame. <laughs> just, just think about that for a moment. Well, in our business, if you're hitting only one in three, they're going to, they, they, they're going to put you before the firing squad, for goodness sake. So those are the kind of things we need to, uh, we need to keep in mind. Thanks. Um, questions from the group? Do, do you have, does somebody have the mic? Yes. Uh, oh, here you go. Hold on. Here's the mic. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, I too feel very educated by those presentations. They're really good. And I'm going to make a sort of false dichotomy in dividing them into to two groups. One, Godans and, and Oren talking about a decisions, sort of relatively high level decisions that were made that should flow to have excellent consequences. And then, and Mona and Soji talking about certain actions that had been, that had been happening and what you might interpret from those. And the reason I'm making that, di as I say, false dichotomy, because it's, uh, it, it, it's really so that, so that I can use this as a didactic device, but, but it's, to say, it's to say we're talking about change. The basis of all of what we're talking about here is how do you get this change process from one set, one system to another system. And do we think that it's a change process that you can, as it were, legislate for, that you make decisions and things flow from that? Or do we think that it's a situation where we see actions happening and you then bring in the legislation to, to, to capture that um, and to, to, in, to encourage it. So what do we think is going on, on here first? Or, or, yeah. I'll just jump right into that, thank you. Um, I think it depends on the organization. I think it depends on the culture of the organization, and I think the experience as well. When I look at UNICEF, um, it's both. I think it started with actions. I mean, we have a long history of engaging with private sector actors, the broad definition that I described earlier. And I think it's the results that we've been able to demonstrate over a period of 30, 40 years have led us to a place where the leadership now recognizes the great value in really kind of ramping up our engagement with business in particular. Um, you know, I joined UNICEF 10 years ago, and I would say still at that stage, I mean, there were a lot of naysayers, a lot of the real diehard kind of technical colleagues who had been in the organization for 20 years who didn't want anything to do with business. Well, you know what? We've demonstrated that, okay, you can get some money, but more importantly, you can have conversations. We can have deep and meaningful conversations with the food and beverage industry. It doesn't mean we're in bed with them, per se but we are in a position to influence and that willingness to engage in those types of conversations, I think, um, and to see that we've managed to shift the needle in several of these industries, um, I think that has been a slow process and that has brought people, you know, made people realize that, okay, you know what, maybe there is a different way. Now in our case, we then have a new leadership that comes on board who's deeply committed to these principles, so I think that top down is really kind of complementing the actions, if you will. Got it. Just to second what, what Oren is saying, I mean, we have 70 years of <coughs> history of, of, of action and legislation. At the first World Health Assembly, the NGO principles were so controversial, they were not adopted in 1948. So that was controversial across the history. Those principles were once revised in 1978 after Almata, uh, after knew we need to do more. And we were constantly engaging and constantly facing the challenges. In 2000, Grohar and Brundtland wanted to uh, bring private sector engagement uh, guidelines. <laughs> she stopped short from bringing that to the assembly. It was just noted by the executive board it was too controversial. 2003, a civil society initiative failed, too controversial. And in more and more, more both negotiations and concrete en engagements, we were so much stuck that it was clear we need a solid mandate to go further. That was the, the trigger for defense and negotiation. And now having that, 
now it's about the implementation and there while, uh, while, while Oren was speaking before and uh, I, I realized that I mentioned the education we have to do on our side. I see a lot of need of education in the private sector to learn how you have to engage with government and intergovernmental organizations. That needs, it's the mutual learning of how is the other functioning, which is the key to, to make partners, uh, partnership uh, a success. And then, Sochi, I couldn't agree with, with your point of excluding of the, the academies more. I, I used to be a doctor earlier in my life, and the medical exceptionalism, the thinking that health is something for doctors, is a huge problem. When I was Global Health Ambassador of Switzerland, not having been a career diplomat, I had always a career diplomat from the Foreign Affairs as, as deputy. Four of them came and said, but I'm not a doctor. If you negotiate climate agreement, do you need a, a, a PhD in climate science? Obviously not. That's negotiated. That's partnership people. But in the health field, we still think it's a doctor's business. So there we need to move out on both sides again to actually being, be, being much better in engaging. Anybody? Question? So, yeah, my name is Benjamin. Uh, I come from Kenya, a company called Safaricom Limited. I lead a unit called Social in Technology for Development, previously Social Innovation. My question goes to World Health Organization and UNICEF. Do you have specific in-country use cases whereby you could um, tell us of how you've been able to engage with private sector and came up with um, a solution or, or even a co-creation which has been replicated in other countries or in that specific country. The reason why I ask this is that uh, I've had a lot of engagements for the last five years I've been at um, Safaricom with the UN bodies and uh, we've not been able to make a lot of progress as far as uh, coming up with something which is concrete. And I would also give an example, not um, uh, specifically with uh, other agencies like USID, whereby they can pick a specific program within the Ministry of Health, work with the private sector, and eventually end up um, coming up with a product which can be replicated in other areas. I'll be excited to hear some of those um, use cases or examples which have ever worked in some of either developing countries or other areas in which you operate. Yeah. I, I think you you refer that to Gaudens and Oren, right? UNICEF and WHO. I'm looking at my cheat sheet here. Uh. Um, so I'm not going to share any specific, like detailed case studies because. Um, uh, but I can I can get these to you. What what I what I do want to say is that, I mean I know that in Africa I believe in Kenya, you know UNICEF has collaborated with Millicom. I know that in South Africa we've had an ex, uh, long-standing collaboration with Unilever around Walsh initiatives. I mean there are many such examples. I mean some with global partners, others with national partners. Um, I know that, I mean, in India, I think we've collaborated with Tata. So, you know, I can certainly get that information and share it with you, but I think the more important sort of statement or sort of comment to make is that, you know, we spoke earlier about the actions and the examples that we've had. And in fact, there are as many, if not more, examples of our collaboration with business, both national companies as well as, uh, you know, sort of smaller organizations um, where we've been able to really kind of demonstrate what a good shared value partnership looks like. Uh, certainly across Africa and Asia, I would say these are, are two really big examples. Um, but if anyone's interested, I mean, this information, you know, is sort of off the shelf. I can find it for you and, and certainly share it with you. Gaudens, did you? I cannot give you examples and let me explain why. On the one hand, th there are examples, but I cannot give them. On the one hand, we are struggling on our external relation to build up coherence that we actually know from each other across the house what we are doing. Um, so a lot is done, but we 
coming of the tradition of a doctor's organization, we are still in the build-up phase. Similarly, the build-up of and rollout of the FENSA tools, in three years' time, I'll, I'll tell you, go to the register of non-state actors and go and, and search, and there will be multiple examples, but there we are still weak that we need to get much better in that communication, in that transparency, and in that internal information flow also. Thank you. Um, in, in the back, and then, oh, please, Aji. Sorry. This in the spirit of partnership. So at, by the end of this, you will not be able to distinguish be, among the folks from UNICEF, WHO, the bank, and PAC. So, <laughs> so we're making progress. Very, uh, just a couple of quick examples. Uh, one um, is in Ecuador, uh, where there, there was this uh, corporation called uh, Febeca, which was operating high-end uh, a high-end high -end pharmacy chain, but in the same country, of course, uh, many of the poor have long endured limited or no access to affordable, high-quality uh, medicines. So what the IFC did was to team up with, the, uh, with that firm, uh, Febeca, and then they established a second chain of pharmacies, uh, which has now enabled uh, poor customers uh, across the country to purchase high-quality medicines. Uh, and toiletries at affordable prices. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll be able, happy to share with you more details of this. Is actually the cheat sheet is uh, available on the, uh, on the uh, IFC website. It's a second one, and since you are from Safaricom, so uh, Abariako, um, in, in Kenya, the, the, the managed equipment scheme that I talked about. Uh, now, folks, just to say, uh, I don't have anything against doctors. Some of my best friends are doctors. <laughs> So the doctors in this room, could you please raise up your hand? <laughs> hey, it's okay. Nobody's perfect. Go on. Raise up your hand. Okay. So if you worked in uh, low or lower middle income countries in the past, you will, of course, know that many of the hospitals are actually equipment morgues or equipment mortuaries. You buy them and you dump them. Because last time I checked, doctors in med school, at least when I went to med school a long time ago, we were not taught to fix equipment. Okay. But the practice continued. So what the money equipment scheme uh, has, has pioneered or at least tested is to move from this purchasing to a leasing arrangement, okay? So that the company takes on a lot of the risks. They do the installation, they do the maintenance, and all of those pesky things. And doctors can actually concentrate on what they were trained to do, which is order these tests and read the results and treat their patients. Now, there's still a lot to be learned and unpacked here. So I'm not here to say, gee, they found the, uh, the perfect solution to the problem. Goodness, no. But th the point is this. Um, the IFC and the World Bank partners in, uh, partnered in this with the government and with, in this case, GE was a private company, but this is, I'm not advertising for GE. I'm just setting this as an example. There, thereby removing, or at least uh, um, alleviating that particular problem, so that the, the diagnostic services could be more reliably available in that setting. So that's one example from Ecuador. That's another one from, uh, from Kenya. Good. Thank you. So in the back, and then if we can come to the front to Sir George, and then we'll go to the back. John. Hi, Ed, it's uh, John Monahan at Georgetown University. Uh, I want to thank the panel. Um, I thought it was terrific. And, and rather than dividing the panel uh, as the previous questioner, I, I really thought everything you all said was, was really quite amazing. C came away with this idea that it is very complicated to align the kinds of institutions you're talking about, what we were talking about bringing together in these partnerships. And I want to drive it on this idea of brokering, which seemed to come up in everybody's conversation, this idea that there's a function where you're multilingual and understand the nuances of the structure of WHO and the drivers, as Soji has said, of private sector in the markets. And how is all that going to happen? And, and, and who, who owns that brokering function? Is that a role that each organization needs to have? Or is there some way that the global community could make, could, could um, put more brokers in play, maybe to help facilitate more relation, more excuse me, partnerships. Anyone want to take that? All right. Happy to jump in. Thank you. Um, so I think as, as I alluded to earlier, the, the brokering function within UNICEF is really deemed 
a critical part of the success of any of these partnership negotiations. And I would say, in fact, if you look at even some of our more, you know, established, long, um, sort of long-lasting kind of partnerships, both with business and with, with foundations, th there's a sense that we've been leaving a lot on the table. And I'm not talking about money. I'm just talking about the opportunity to really drive a different scale of ambition, different kind of results. Um, you know, within UNICEF, we have, you know, there are a number of, uh, I'll sort of address this three ways. Um, we have a global division. It is called the Private Fundraising and Partnerships Division. I mean, we are 200 strong. We are based in Geneva. We are based in New York. And so we are both, you know, we deal with normative issues in terms of coming up with the guidelines. We also um, do the action part and manage a lot of those partnerships. Um, we have our national committees, which I spoke to earlier, our national committees. These are um, uh, nationally registered charities. Uh, in this country, the U.S. Fund for UNICEF, which Gab Gabriella represents. I mean, they are the front-facing sort, of, uh, sort of interlocutors with our private sector partners. So whether it's in the U.S., the U.K., Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, what have you. I mean, that's a massive network. And I would say that, you know, uh, the vast majority of certainly the finances have come from these national committee markets. But if you look at the advocacy angle in terms of working with national governments, this comes from these, these charities, uh, nonprofits as well. But then there's the whole field perspective. And so within UNICEF, you know, until, as I've alluded to a few times, until 10 years ago, I mean, this whole private sector engagement piece was all happening at the global level. And when I say global, I mean, it, it's really, it's, it's the developed world. It's the countries with the big money. But what's happened is that um, our, our emerging markets and our middle-income countries that have really grown in scale and wealth over the last few years um, have increasingly become a very, very important part of this broader family. So we, we now have two dozen uh, country offices out of our 150 which, which have a formal mandate to engage in private sector issues, everything I've discussed. And that number is just going to keep growing. Um, but I think the other point is, and I think this is really, this is the tipping point now, is there is a recognition that we cannot do it alone. The technical people can't do it alone, so we have to do it together. And the most amazing outcome for me of the collaboration with Gates, and I forgot to mention, I mean, this took us almost two years. We engaged with over 200 colleagues across both organizations to really figure out what this collaboration looks like. I mean, this is a case in point. You know, you can have the best minds, the best doctors in the world, but unless you know how to fix the problem and have the right kind of conversations, you're not going to get there. And so, you know, at least in my case, in my organization, you know, we've decentralized the process, we've pushed it out, and uh, and it's actually a very exciting time to be part of, of this exercise. Yeah, uh, I think this is a fascinating question. So I want to take a step at it from two, two different angles. The, the, the first one is maybe we, we, could, we could look at this in terms of reverse engineering uh, some of the successes. And few things are absolute successes. So I'm using the word success in a, in a descriptive sense. So why did the, the, the agreement with, uh, with the pharmaceutical company on uh, ivermectin, why did, it, why did it come into being? Um, it was leadership. It was vision. It was people being what I will call constructively crazy and willing to dare to take the, take the risk. Uh, you should buy uh, or, or go pay Professor Adel Lucas a visit, and he can tell you a graphic story about how those things happened. Uh, I happen to have benefited from uh, his, his wisdom on this in terms of how the agreement was actually cut uh, to get as many as you need for as long as you need. So everybody should have tea with Professor, uh, Professor Lucas, okay? And then I'm going to be politically incorrect here and say everybody needs to understand and become comfortable in engaging in serious conversations with, yes, big pharma. Okay, that's not a politically correct thing to say, I know. So I'm probably going to be excommunicated by, 
the global public health fraternity and sorority, but that's okay. Because my experience in working with them uh, was that when you actually have, when you sit down and you, you go to it, and you're willing to engage in very tough, challenging discussions, but you really go to the evidence, you really go to the substance, you can actually get a partnership that works. So we, uh, in, the, in the work that we did on the affordable medicines facility for malaria, which was a frank public sector, private sector partnership, and I'm talking about the for public and uh, for profit uh, private sector globally, as well as in-country supply chain and retail currencies, Novartis, Sanofi, Aventis, uh, CIPLA, IPCA, it actually worked. Okay, it worked. But the, 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 the point is, perhaps the fact that that success worked despite the conventional wisdom of the global health fraternity and sorority, uh, there were a lot of antibodies in the process. And that is where the political economy of development assistance comes in. Okay? So there are entrenched interests in development assistance for health. And if you have a new business model that is successful, but that's going to erode the dominance of those deeply entrenched traditional models, then you might have a problem on your hands. Just like you know, the fossil fuel industry really doesn't want to talk about climate change and clean energy. Thanks. Mona, do you want to jump in here? And then Gowden, sorry. It's a big yeah. question, so it's lots big... of people, everybody wants to take it, John. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, my answer would be all of the panelists here, but also what we call development partners when living in low- and middle-income countries, whether you're a donor, whether you're an NGO-like PATH, whether you're UNICEF, World Bank. I mean, it's incumbent upon all of us to play that broker role. That's part of our job, and I think depends on the culture of the organization and, and kind of the composition of the organization. At PATH, like I said, it's 41 years of this was what we were formed to do. And so it comes a little bit easier, I think, compared to other organizations where I've worked that are really focused on civil society strengthening, for example. But I think it's really the role of all development partners to play that role. But I also agreed with the point you know, those development partners are leaving as countries develop. It's incumbent upon governments to learn to speak to private sector and learn the language and the private sector to understand how to, you know, enter the conversation with state actors. So I would just say it's, it's everybody's job. Audience. I think, John, you're, you're spot on. At WHO, the, the problem as such is recognized, if you look at the 13th general program of work, the strengthening of leadership, of health diplomacy, of partnership is very clearly recognized as, as needed. Now create the resources. What does that mean? It means building up the resources. We are by far smaller in, uh, in debt than, than you are at, at UNICEF. Training in-house, training member states, training private sector in health diplomacy and what, what those negotiations entail that you need to, to understand the other one. Uh, so, so that is still a, a long way to go. Also telling donors it's not an overhead or admin cost you're investing in. Usually it's seen as a negative, as a too much because that's overhead. No, it's the key to success. Tedros and... Uh, so she, uh, he uses the, uh, seg uh, regularly the, the crazy ideas, and he asks staff to bring crazy ideas. Many of them are ending on, up on my table. I have to steer the, crea the creation of a WHO foundation, of a World Health Museum. Uh, so yes, we are moving forward in, in, in uncharted territory. We are really making a difference, and I've been on multiple meetings with CEOs of Big Pharma and others. We do that dialogue. Thank you, Sir George. Much I, I should be given. I agree with everything that has been said. <laughs> but a couple of points. The, the title of the session is Organizational Approaches. I am going to look basically at the three or four organizations that are there and point out that we are dealing with how organizations, in a sense, interact with agencies outside of their organizations, because the private sector is outside of WHO, outside of UNICEF, outside of the World Bank, for example. And when you look at uh, why there can be that arrangement, 
why there's that urgency now to have these kind of uh, 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 arrangements written down and categorized? I posit is a lack of trust. Be it is a lack of trust, and the more we have how to engage with private sector written down, how it engaged with civil society organizations, because these agents, the outside of the organizations, there is a lack of trust with, of, about the, of, of the organizations. People worry that the organizations are doing well or are not doing uh, what they wish them to do. So one of the questions we're going to pose, uh, can we revert that? Can we reestablish the trust that used to exist, I contend, used to exist in these organizations when there was not the need to have everything written down and black and white. Because I contend with, a, with, with, with FENSA, it is a reaction of the member states, a group of member states, to lack of trust within the organization. They did not trust the organization. That is, I believe, why FENSA arose. And it is going to, uh, as, as countries change, you're going to find the rules are going to change. Countries are going to have different opinions of FENSA. And I empathize with 200, uh, 2,000 or 200? 2,000. 200. Well, I guarantee the next couple of years they'll grow to 2,000. Uh, <laughs> it was a work. But the, the next point I, I, I would wish to make is, 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 is this. So I, the question I would pose, uh, how would you re go about reestablishing this trust, which I think is fundamental to the interaction reaction between the organizations and the, the other sectors. The second point I'd, I, I'd make, I, I would always contend, Sochi, you said there are five things that you need to have. I said, I got, I, and I have scars to, to, to prove this, there are only three things you need. One is mutuality of interest, two is specificity of purpose, and three is indications of the resources to be brought to the table. Unless you have those three things, no partnership in the world will ever work. There has to be, if there's not mutuality of interest, it will not work. If there's not specificity of purpose, it is nice to dwell together in unity. That doesn't help. You have to do, agree to do something. And it has to be specific indication of the resources uh, to, to, to be brought to bear. Uh, so I, I would, but my, my the last point I'd make is I, I, I would urge that we don't use the word shared value lightly. That has a specific connotation in the management literature and is not uh, the, the word to be used lightly. The other word I, I, I dislike intensely in global health is donor. Under Director Powell, we expunge that word from, you don't see it in any of our documents. There are partners and not donors. And why contend that every one of those people who give in fact, benefit. So it is all of that is a partnership. So I, I, I dislike the idea of the donor-recipient relationship. Good. Anyone care to react? Thank you, Sir George. I, I always agree with Sir George. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. So thank you, Sir George. Um, great points. There was one in the back, and then we're going to bring this to a close. Um, thank you. Um, uh, so I was uh, one of the four that uh, was involved in the starting of the Global Business Coalition on HIV AIDS. And Soji, I, I take your points uh, very well. Uh, I'm a reformed MD in that I became an economist afterwards. And so uh, suddenly played that role of brokerage and speaking different languages. Um, uh, it was interesting in mobilizing the business sector response in that you had to do this reciprocal mobilization of government, NGO, and, uh, and other partners to understand that, wow, this is something that business can do and bring to the table. Um, and in the process of speaking those languages, uh, the GBC, the Global Business Co Coalition, automatically became a broker. And we were outside of all the other organizations, so we were a neutral party that people could trust. And we also then had the lens to actually spot those opportunities that are very hard to see in the day-to-day -day grind um, with each of the organizations. Um, so having that external lens was very important and certainly the usual suspects, the mining and pharma companies were there, but we brought in uh, donations from uh, um, car manufacturers, etc. So they were non-traditional private sector partners that uh, uh, appeal more to the social determinants of health rather than the medicalized approach to health. 
Um, that said, you know, when, when people came to us for partnerships, they would say, we want to do partnerships, and it was like, to what end? So there were partnerships on advocacy and communications, on uh, global policy, on delivery, on product development, on commodities. And so the whole notion of PPPs that all this falls under is just too vast and abstract. And I fear that when we have these guidelines, uh, we get into ideological discussions, and they cannot apply to all of these um, types of partnerships. So something concrete to think about, perhaps. When we do trials, we always have to consult with an IRB, an Institutional Review Board. And could there perhaps be, at a global level and even a country level, some sort of partnerships advisory board or review board that looks at conflicts of interest, that knows where the opportunities lie, know where the pitfalls are, and can advise at a country level to accelerate this? Because we cannot spend five years brokering a partnership uh, when we have to get on with the implementation. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone? But if so let me bring this to a close. Thank you. Those are excellent points. Um, just a couple of things, because we really talked about um, raising the narrative. Someone said trust takes time. Uh, Soji gave us, in terms of changing the culture, five great points. Sir George has broken them down to three. We talked a lot about change, and um, the person in the front talked about that false dichotomy, right, high-level decisions versus actions, and then kind of trying to encourage from that. Uh, we also talked a lot about the need for mutual learning. We've got to we've got to teach from the inside of an organization, but we also have to have stakeholders understand why an organization works the way it works. Um, we talked about brokering and who owns this, and that's a big challenge because at the end of the day, somebody's going to have to lead this charge for us. Um, so we we mentioned reverse engineering of the successes. I think that's an excellent idea. Again. We talked about the lack of trust um, and how can we reestablish that trust. Um, obviously, um, the other thing, and, and, and let me just end with this idea about donors. So I will use the U.S. Food and Drug Administration as the example. We are a regulatory authority. We are not AID. We're not CDC colleagues. And so when we provide a grant, which has been unusual, it's been recent times, that we've done cooperative agreements. But when we do these or provide investments to the World Bank or WHO, we really need to do it in, with clarity around the benefit it is to the US FDA and to the American public. And so we would never consider ourselves a donor. And, and so when we report up the chain about what is a cost, our annual cost for development assistance, our answer is always zero because that's just not the work we do and we're very purposeful in the types of, of awards we made. So I think there's a lot of um, great discussion here. Let me join me when thanking the panel. It's been spot on. <laughs>